All right, there we go. We are recording. One thing I mentioned at the beginning of every single webinar is watch this again uh, when you have that opportunity, relatively shortly after we uh, send this out to you guys. Why? Because it'll sink into your long-term memory. Yes, it's pretty easy to know how to do a short put. You're selling a put. But what we're gonna go into detail in this webinar is the nuances around the short put that will increase your probabilities of success with this strategy, all right? We're not even just gonna be talking about that bullish assumption you need to have with the short put. We're gonna be talking about all kinds of things, uh, like the environment in and around this underlying, whether or not this underlying we're looking at with a bullish assumption is a good underlying to trade options around. So we're gonna have some guidelines for you guys in order to start trading options. And so those nuances might get lost on you, especially if you're a newer option trader uh, that, that will help you down the road if you watch it again. It'll help you also remember it uh, long term. All right. So I'm not just going out there and saying, hey, yeah, go out there and sell a short put in anything you want. Uh, otherwise, this webinar would be over right, over right now. But we're going to go into some details uh, along the way. But uh, I, for some of you guys that are some new faces out there, just want to introduce myself. I'm Eric Wilkinson, and you may well recognize me as a Wolfman from mainstream media, where I've talked about everything from the economic geopolitical environments and how that impacts the overall markets with my market analysis. Well, I do that uh, in my daily market commentaries and basically in these webinars, but I go into a little bit more detail as to option strategies that I have uh, been implementing in my portfolio for over 25 years. And I go into some details uh, of the hard knocks that I've found in trading options try to streamline that process for you guys so you guys don't have to figure it out so much on your own on uh, these guidelines that we've come up with. Uh, so in that time, 25 years, I've traded everything from stocks, uh, financial futures, commodities, uh, currencies, and options on all these products in just about all market conditions. So I know when it's a good time to sell options and when it is not a good time to sell options, uh, which is what we're gonna be kind of talking about today. Also, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at Wolfman's blog. That's my personal account. And our parent company is at ProTrader Strat. So if you want some market wisdom and or snark coming out of me, <laughs> that's the place to uh, follow me. Also, follow our Facebook page, ProTraderStrategies.com, because we're throwing out all kinds of content for you guys. I, like I mentioned, I do daily market commentaries. That's where I'm talking about the economic data, the geopolitical environment, how that's impacting the overall markets with my market analysis. I'm going to be talking about what direction I think things are going to be going and uh, stocks that I find uh, whether or not they're a buying opportunity in my eyes and how we are going to be implementing strategy or how I'm implementing a strategy around that assumption. Now, it's up to you guys to determine whether or not these option strategies are appropriate for you uh, and your risk parameters but we'll go into some details as of um, some of the benefits. And, you know, the lawmakers say that like what we're talking about today, the short put is a very high risk strategy. Well, it is kind of, but it's no more risky than going out there and buying a stock in my eyes on the risk parameters to the upside. So, uh, you know, also with the probabilities of success with this one is probably one of the better probabilities of success of any of the option strategies out there or even just going out and buying a stock. So your probabilities are much better here with uh, this. If you're just doing this for a trade, you know, you're not going to get a dividend and things like that. You know, there are some benefits of owning the stock, but if, as a trader and a, a position trader, this is a very good strategy to implement. And if you have your own portfolio of stocks that you like and you've heard of dollar cost averaging, this is also a great way to do that as well. You basically are giving yourself another dividend on a stock that you like to own um, and, uh, and or would like to own on maybe even a pullback. Now that we're at all time highs, this is uh, a good opportunity to start adding some strategies like this to your portfolio. Now, I've talked about the short put, you guys. Uh, in webinars where we are specifically 
talking about portfolio adjustments and things of that nature. With this, I'm more of a, uh, a trade based on a directional assumption that we're going to be going into. So like I said, when I, I mentioned watch this again, you could go out there and watch one of those other short put videos because you guys drive the content and every course is a little bit different designed for specific um, moments that we are going to be looking at for a portfolio. So please check those out as well. Hey, check it out. Alexander's in the house. Good to see you guys. Thanks for the shout out. All right. So now I mentioned this is the roadmap to uh, trading options, right? So when we're talking about a roadmap, the reason why I wanted to relate this is because, you know, when you're looking at a roadmap, like down here in the corner here, you can see there's all kinds of pathways to get to any place that we want to go. Well, what we need to decide is which road is the best way to get to that uh, destination based on all of the things going on in and around our directional uh, motivation for that destination, right? So like if we are traveling north, which way do we want to go? Do we want to see different sites along the way or uh, do we want to get there really quick? Well, the options uh, will the option um, minutia, the little things going on in and around that underlying options are really going to determine how we get there, okay? And I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, as we go along. But one of the things we need to know is what is our roadmap key? You know, that little insert down at the bottom of a map that tells us how far, you know, this distance is. Is that one mile? Is that 10 miles, right? Um, so what we need to know is these Greeks. And yes, I know a lot of people are just like, okay, I, I'm going to tune out for a little bit because I hate learning about Greeks. Well, I've got some really simple ways to remember these that'll kind of help stick it into your brain a little bit better, hopefully. So um, if I can find my pen here. So Delta is one of the most important Greeks that everybody talks about. Um, I look at a couple of the other ones as well that I think are even more important than maybe even Delta. But Delta is the effect of an option premium uh, in relation to what the underlying is doing. So basically what this is saying, if the underlying, let's just say we're looking at XYZ and it goes up by $1, right? That is XYZ goes up by a dollar, then the delta, that number is affecting that option premium strike that we're looking at, okay? So delta is also data. Uh, it tells us a lot of different things of like probability, um, uh, it tells us basically five different things that we can talk about. But for right now, I want to narrow it down to just how it is going to affect uh, those options premiums that we're looking at. So let me just pull up a uh, platform here and uh, look at Delta. Come on, baby. It's underneath everything right now, so it's hard for me to grab it. All right, so let's pull this over here. So um, Delta is going to affect our option premium. So we can look at the puts and the calls on either one of these really. So I'm just gonna look at the puts for right now because we're looking at the short put, right? So if XYZ goes up by $1, uh, that's what I want. If XYZ goes up by $1, and we are specifically looking at gold right here, but let's just say for instance, this 83 strike that we're looking, 183 strike. Sometimes you guys on the floor, we used to chop off that one handle, right? Because that was like a given. So if you ever hear me looking at something that's 183 and I just say 83, it's because I'm so used to just chopping that off. It, it's, a, it's a given, right? So the 183 puts here, we're looking at those. Right now they're $4.50 bid at $4.60 offer. Well, if this underlying XYZ goes up by $1, right? Is what we were talking about. We go up by $1, we're looking at 84.50. Right. So that means that these premiums, this 183 strike is going to go up by 47 cents. And so the next one dollar higher, we would be looking at the bid being uh, one or sorry, four dollars and ninety seven cents on the bid. And on the offer, we're going to be looking at five dollars and seven cents. Right. Because they've gone up by that 47 cents, which is this delta. Down here. OK, so it's just gone up by that. 47 cents. 
And that's on that first dollar move. Um, and, and and I'm sorry, I just misspoke there. Uh, we're looking at the put side. So that's a negative delta, right? So uh, I got ahead of myself. I usually just talk about the call side and I want to specifically go to the put side. So uh, we've gone up by a dollar. So Wolfman, you just messed up on this misspoke, I should say. So we've gone up by $1. Well, we can look over here at the put side and we see that that delta is actually, in fact, negative. So that's because we're assuming always with these Greeks that it's a dollar move higher or a uh, advancement, we could say. So on a dollar move higher with a negative delta, right? We've got a plus, a negative delta. That means that would be subtracting out of here. And I'm sorry for misspeaking there, but this would then be a dollar and two or four dollars and two cents on that bid. And then this offer would then decrease by the corresponding 48 cents here, right? So then we would be looking at this being uh, $4 and uh, 12 cents, okay? So they would decrease. Over here on the call side, that is a positive delta. So these would be the one that increased by that corresponding delta on that dollar move higher because we moved up by $1 here. So then we're looking at uh, these being uh, 49 cents going in here. So we're looking at $5 and uh, four cents on the bid and $5 and nine cents on the offer. Okay, because that increased by that corresponding delta, all right? So the puts will decrease on that dollar advancement. Now, if this went down by a dollar, right? If we went down by one dollar and we're now at uh, one eighty uh, two fifty, so let's just consider we've moved down by a dollar here, and now we can, I'm going to erase this stuff. We've moved down by one dollar. Then that's when. A negative dollar, so we've got a negative dollar move, right? So a negative dollar plus a negative delta makes that a positive delta then. That's when these puts would then increase by the corresponding delta, which would be then that uh, $4.98 on the bid and the $5.08 on the offer, okay? So that... And then on this side, if we went down by $1, then this negative one plus a positive delta would then uh, make that a negative delta to these. So if the underlying went down by a dollar, we would then be looking at these being $4.06 and uh, $4.11. And I did that off the top of my head, yes. Um, so, Delta affects those options premium for that move in the underline. Now, if we move over to the next Greek, which is going to be gamma. Gamma, let me try and move this out of the way a little bit. Gamma, the way to remember this one is, gamma is the relation, or is the change in delta. And gamma only affects on the next move. After that $1 move, then gamma goes with delta. So just think of that. Gamma goes, goes, or goes with delta. All right. Goes to delta. All right. And that's on this was dollar number one. Now we're looking at dollar number two. Okay. So if we pull up that option montage again and uh look at our premiums again. So now we've had a two dollar move higher. So now on this one, we're going to be looking at being at 185, so I'm just talking about $2 move higher here. Remember that first dollar move, we were looking at um, $5 and six, uh, five dollars and four cents on the bid and uh, $5 and nine cents on the offer, 509. So that was on uh, $1 move. Now we're looking at the $2 move, so we've had $2. Now this is when the gamma here goes with the delta, all right? So the next dollar move higher, our premiums would increase then by 52 cents, right? 
So if we were at $5.04, the next increment higher to on the second dollar move, we'd be looking at $5 and what did I say, 52 cents. So $5 and 56 on the bid and then $5 and 50, uh, what did I say, 52 cents. So $5 and 61 cents on the offer, okay? Because that's the second dollar move. Vice versa, we've got gamma, right? Gamma is positive over here on the put side. So that second, first dollar move, we saw it, uh, these premiums decrease by 48 cents because that was a positive move. Well, we still have a negative delta plus a positive gamma. Well, gamma goes with delta. So we are looking at, on the first dollar move, these premiums would decrease by 48 cents. On the second dollar move, on dollar number two, right, it's only going to decrease by 45 cents, okay? So we've got a negative delta plus a positive gamma, then it would decrease by 45 cents, slightly less, right? And as you can see, the deltas as further out we go are smaller, um, but as that positive move happens. Now, if we had a negative $2 move, right, a negative plus a, a positive delta makes that a positive delta and gamma is positive. So if we were decreasing, then gamma goes with delta and adds into it, all right? It makes it positive. Uh, when you buy a put, and uh, when do you buy a put and when do you sell a put? That is a great question. And that is the question of the day, uh, Rafik. We're going to talk about that. Let me just get this uh, these Greeks out of the way so everybody understands them real quick. Quick, It might be further along the road than everybody else, but I just want to do this for some people for uh, uh, that are newer to options, all right? But we'll get to that here very shortly. All right, theta. Theta is the thief in the night. All right, He's, theta is the thief that impacts our premium. He basically, every night, comes in and steals money from us, all right? Now, if you're buying a put, Rock, Rafik, right, that's not a good thing. But if you're selling a put, then that is a good thing because when you want to sell high and buy low, then you want that thief Coming in, like you're leaving the door open. How do you leave the door open? Well, you exploit it. You kind of put a sign out in front and being like, front door's open, you know, everything's free or whatever. I don't know what you're going to do there. But at the end of the day, we are trying to take advantage of theta. All right. And there are certain time frames, certain durations where we can really take advantage of this theta component. So, um, you know, I, we were talking about the short put, it's kind of leading you to believe, well, we want to take advantage of this theta. And if we are going to take advantage of theta, um, we probably want nearer duration because theta affects the nearer duration options more than the further duration. And Vega is the only Greek that isn't a Greek. It's the imposter. But Vega, in my eyes, is the most important component to look at. So you really have to understand and put your uh, tin foil caps on right now so you can remember this and block everything else out. Vega measures the change in volatility and that affects our premium. Now remember, uh, when we were talking about a couple of these Greeks, right, we were talking about theta, it's the thief in the night. Well, you, you can't get rid of theta. It's always a negative, right? So theta is the thief in the night. Every night it is more and more aggressive. You can see the uh, closer we get to expiration, that theta component starts increasing, right? It's 12 cents there, it's eight cents here. And if we go out 200 some odd days, you can see theta is not as, a, a, as aggressive, right? So if you want to take advantage of theta, you wanna get a little bit closer to the monthlies that are closer to expiration, all right? Um, to take advantage of that increasing, the closer and closer we get, the more and more it gets aggressive. Now, volatility, Vega, Vega is this column over here or here, but it's also this number. So when we're talking about this number uh, specifically with Vega, if we were talking about an advancement, right? That would be, considering this went from 25 
92 to now we're at 2692. All right. So it increases by just that one percentage point. Well, then that would then add in to those premiums. The corresponding Vega would add into it for a one percentage point increase. And you might think, oh, okay, that seems like a lot, one percentage point. Well, it's not. Like we, especially in 2020, one percentage point move in volatility is nothing. But you can see that this volatility coefficient is actually pretty big, right? I mean, 21 cents for every one percentage point increase or decrease. That means the underlying hasn't changed. We haven't lost a day in time. Uh, nothing else has changed. We're isolating this second. It just upticks by one percentage point. 21 cents goes into those premiums and vice versa on the other side. Now, obviously, deeper in the money or deeper out of the money, you can see volatility is slightly less, but it's still a major component of this pricing. So one percentage point increase, that goes in there. Again, vice versa, on the flip side of the coin, if it went down by one percentage point, then our premiums would decrease by that, right? Because minus one percentage point plus a positive volatility or vega, that makes it negative, all right? So as volatility goes down, that 21% comes, or 21 cents comes out of our premium, all right? So uh, starting to get those wheels turning, you know, obviously, we want, if we're selling premium or if we have really high volatility for this underlying, then we want to start considering selling those options premiums. So Rafik, when we were talking earlier about when do you buy a put, when do you sell a put? Well, all of these things are starting to come together, right? If you want to sell a put, you need volatility vega to be really high, right? Well, that's a bit of a conundrum here because is 26.92 high or low for GLD? That's, we're not talking VIX. I'm not, I don't even care about VIX, right? Well, I do care about VIX, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but VIX doesn't impact every single underlying, right? Some stocks, when the VIX is starting to spike, it's because maybe the tech sector is really getting crazy. All right, um, but it is a general overall arching volatility coefficient, but not all stocks, not all ETFs are created equal. So what we need to do is really drill down on, in this case, GLD, and decide or discern whether a 26 or a 27 uh, bit volatility vega it's high or low for this particular underlying. And I'll show you a couple little tricks. Did you sell the 170 uh, puts on the GLD? Yes, I am short uh, the 170 puts in GLD. And I'm gonna talk about the, the way that this trade has gone also. Uh, and I did this last week on GLD. So I'm not trying to just give you guys an example of a trade and want you guys to limbing off the cliff with me. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to be talking about this 170 strike today. Uh, um, we're going to be talking about a couple other ones. So, yes, you know, um, GLD fits all the rules for, uh, you know, selling options. And just because I'm bullish in, in GLD right now is why I did that. You know, don't necessarily think that, uh, you know, I'm that guy that that is trying to cherry pick a trade to get you guys to limbing off the cliff with me. That is not my style, all right? Uh, I'm just here to find the examples that um, that fit the guidelines that I've come up with for trading options. So uh, I think everybody's pretty much got what theta is, right? It impacts the, the premiums, one percentage point increase. Our premiums go up by that corresponding vega, 1% decrease. That's a negative to all premiums right? A negative, we can see volatility or VIX, or sorry, uh, volatility or Vega is positive for both. And that's because it's an assumption of an advancement. But if it goes down, all the premiums in that underlying go down by that corresponding Vega, all right? So a negative to 
volatility makes those premiums go down. All right. So I may have kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit, but where are we going, right? We've kind of talked about this. I want you to guys take that whole idea of we've uh, sidelined um, the idea that we're selling a put right now, okay? I want to go through this process like you and I do on a daily basis, right? However you come up with your market assumption, I don't know. But, um, you know, I kind of let the cat out of the bag with GLD. I'm kind of leaning towards that. I, I, I am bullish in GLD. I already mentioned that, you know, whether or not you did it off of a chart setup. Um, Buffett, finally, for once in a lifetime, I don't think it's once in a lifetime, but it's been a very, very long time since he's invested in the gold miners. Well, GLD is uh, um, going to, you know, benefit from uh, the advancement of gold. You could look at GDX, which is the gold miners index. That's the big guys. Um, and or GDXJ, which is the junior gold miners. So those are also ones that you could look at for a bullish assumption in gold. All right. Um, and we'll go through that whole process of, you know, all right, I've got this bullish assumption. What's the best idea? Uh, and how do we narrow it down to the right underlying too, right? So where are we going? Uh, we're going to go to GLD. So currently, if I'm bullish in GLD, obviously, uh, it's me down here. And we're going to say GLD is up here, right? And there's all these different ways we could go. We could go this way. We could go, you know, this way. One of the things is, is, you know, I don't know which way GLD is going to go specifically right now, right? I, I believe it's bullish, but one of the things is, is maybe I want to take Route 66 up there, right? I don't want to have to worry about a very bullish move, okay? Um, but I, I want to go to my destination is GLD. Uh, we kind of determined that. so. We know uh, that we are basically looking at a bullish direction. But what if, you know, I could be a little bit concerned about a, a market neutral uh, directionality. Maybe it's kind of topped out and um, it's going to just kind of hang out around these lower 2000s or upper uh, 1900s. You know, that, that, that could be a concern, right? Um, and um, when you're buying options, that, that could be a problem if you're just buying it. And that data, the thief in the neck that steals our premiums is just going to start taking it away from you. Uh, I don't want that. All right. So we've got this bullish direction. We kind of need to chart out, you know, more people plan out their uh, vacation or their uh, overall what they're going to do on their vacation. They spend more time doing that than they actually plan their overall investment strategy for the year. So, <laughs> you know, uh, you should spend more time, not you, but everyone should spend a little bit more time on uh, driving and uh, coming up with this. So when we're talking about this destination, all right, what we want to do is we want to look at the that underlying that, that we have. Is it, is it a good destination? What I mean by that is, is there a lot going on? Like we don't want to go to Holville or, <laughs> you know, a, a one stoplight town where you blink and you're through it, right? There's nothing to do there. There's not a lot of things going on. Well, what I'm talking about with this is we want free market price discovery in full swing. And one of the easiest ways to figure that out is, by looking at the option montage. And when I'm talking about the option montage, I'm talking about this page here. Uh, it's got all of the different, um, the months, the different expiration cycles, right? So uh, one of the easiest ways to figure this out is if we are looking at this option montage, I want you to check out the ones that are closest to, you know, days to expiration. We wanna go to the days that are about 35 days to expiration, all right? So as close to that, um, the closest we have to that is 29 right now. And that's because that's the spot month is what we used to call it on the floor. That's where all the eyeballs are, right? Uh, that's where the most volume and open interest, generally speaking, is going to be focused. So 
when we're looking at this, we're going to look at the bid offer on the puts and the calls, basically at the money or just out of the money options. Okay. So kind of draw your line down here and we're going to kind of pick these out at around the 35 days to expiration option montage. And if it is greater than a hundred dollars stock, we got something that's greater than a hundred dollars. Then basically we're just going to move the decimal like here. We're going to move it one, two, three, right? Move it three decimal places to the left. And we basically are looking at 18 cents. So we need this to be less than or equal to 18 cents to fit this guideline. All right. Uh, we don't want to take a road that is, uh, got got a washboard on it which is like a dirt road you know when you're going down a dirt road it's like that's the washboard that means uh you know that's not the road we want to take uh, or that uh path but um so you can see here that this fits that rule it's over a hundred dollars so it fits the rule of uh less than or equal to 18 cents so right now i can start seeing that gld is a good destination. It's a good underlying. There's a lot going on here that I can trade it. Now, if it is uh, less than a hundred dollars stock, if we're less than a stock that's a hundred dollars, then basically I want it to be less than or equal to ten cents wide on the bid offer in that option montage. Okay. So any stock less than a hundred dollars, you know, ten cents wide. It doesn't matter what it is. All right. You can go over there and look at volume and open interest to see if there's a lot of volume and open interest on it. But I'm all about streamlining the process. I, I want to look at something and immediately recognize whether or not this has good markets, right? Good free market price discovery, because I don't want to give up a lot of edge to get in and out. And I know almost intuitively if it's fitting this um, guideline that that it is a good underlying to trade. There's a lot of eyeballs on it okay uh keeping an eye on it so if it gets a little bit wider than that uh we can look at it like you know as the stoplight uh um you know just to correlate it you know we've got this stoplight idea right so if it fits my rule uh then it's a green light right if it's two times the rule then we're looking at a yellow light right Three times the rule, just kind of walk away from it right now. Uh, you know, unless, you know, unless you trade this underlying a lot and you've got a lot of patience, which I probably don't, um, then, you know, kind of follow this, this rule. If you get too many uh, yellow lights, I don't know what happened there. I need to go back. If you get too many yellow lights here, uh, and I'll be talking about it, uh, you know, on environment and all of those things like volatility, you get too many yellow lights, you know, you got to really proceed with caution, okay? And that means just have a short leash on or a short rip cord to get out of this trade. Uh, and re red lights, uh, if you're a newer trader, I would just kind of start looking at something else. Um, you know, like uh, we'll talk about this, uh, where we would get a red light with this specific uh, uh, assumption that we have in, or I have in gold, all right? Uh, so we know that this fits the rule. So that is a green light so far for GLD on, yes, there that it checks it off that GLD, you know, we're going to go see the bean, which is kind of funny because I got to, I got to show you guys something that if you guys watched a few of these, uh, you guys know, you've heard me talk about, um, I am a desk. I, like a roadside attraction junkie. Uh, I like the road trip and I like to hit all those stupid places that people laugh about. Uh, all right, so the right environment. We've got the right destination. Now, the right environment, what we're talking about is, in a sense, volatility. So if you want to think about volatility as low volatility, you know, it's sunny skies. There's, there's no stress when you're driving, right? Uh, but when it gets dark and overcast or it's pouring down rain, lightning, difficult to see, your car wants to hide hydroplane. Uh, you know, you can think I'm stressed. And that's usually what the markets are doing as well, right? 
you know, we see high volatility when markets are stressed uh, and low volatility when, when it's everything's hunky-dory, right? Uh, but think of it that way. When it's high volatility, we want to get there as fast as we can, right? We want to kind of beeline there or have a shorter duration on the road, right? We talked about this. Shorter, high volatility, we want to kind of beeline it there, shorter duration. Uh, we want uh, that theta component is starting to ramp up. So putting this together, we have high volatility. We want to take advantage of that high volatility, right? Because when it comes out, uh, our premium shrinks. So that's leading you to believe when you have high volatility, you're thinking, I want to sell it. And when you want to sell it, you know, you're thinking about that theta component. You want all of these things to come together and work in your favor because that increases your probabilities of success. You don't want to just go out there and pick out of the hat. Okay, today I'm going to be buying a call. No, we've had a, we've come up with that directional assumption. We want to drill down on, you know, when, when is the right time to, you know, uh, Rafik, do we want to sell a put or buy a call, right, on that bullish assumption? And volatility really is going to be the key determining factor as to whether or not we would be buying a uh, call or selling a put, right? So um, with our specific underline, what we're going to be looking at is you take the current IV to figure this out. Because remember when I talked about that uh, GLD trade, right? We were talking about 26 or 27, I can't remember exactly what that number was, but was that number, it was 26, I think, was that number high or low for that underlying? So the way to determine this is to use this uh, very simple problem, mathematical problem, right? So we take where the current IV is minus the low IV, Take that sum and divide it by the high minus low. So basically, what does this problem tell us? It tells us where this current implied volatility for XYZ or GLD is in relation to where the underlying's been. So in GLD, um, it's right now, it's right around, let's just call it 25, all right? And say the low that we've seen in GLD is 10. All right, I'll show you this on a chart here in a minute. And then we take the high, which was about 50, minus the low, which is about 10, right? So we're looking at 15 divided by 40, and that gives us uh, 15, uh, 40 goes into 15, basically point, I think it's uh, point three seven something, all right? So basically we'd be saying it's in a 30, seven percentile okay so um oh you know what i have that i have that coming up pretty soon uh, i got a little ahead of myself so basically the idea is remember this mathematical equation i have the script that you can throw over there in the watch list but one of the things that we reason why it's more important right now to know this uh equation is you know when we had that crash, we got volatility spiking to a point where, you know, during this coronavirus, believe it or not, the VIX was higher during the coronavirus than it was from 2008, 2009 time. All right. Uh, it basically back to 87 is the last time we saw the VIX really spike that high. Uh, and so therefore, you know, and before that, I think it was like 1929. So a real outlier, like a true black swan event. So we might want to kind of discount at least some of that. Now, do I think that volatility is uh, going to go back to, you know, 2019, which was way down here, kind of, right? You know, we used to see 1315 in the VIX and think that that was getting pretty decent or get up into the 20s. And we were thinking, okay, volatility is pretty high. Well, we saw the VIX shoot up to like 80, and right now I think it's in the 20s. So is the new 20s, the new teens? Uh, it might very well be for the rest of 2020 uh, or until there's a, you know, uh, a cure here. But so we're kind of seeing 
volatility expand. So now we don't want to discount all of that high, but we might want to just kind of take the snapshot from here to, and going here and saying, this is the kind of the low and sub, right? Uh, so we might need to strip out some of it and really come up with why does volatility matter? I think I kind of mentioned this already. Well, it's because when volatility is high, we want to sell premium. When volatility is low, we want to buy premium. So we need to know where that is. And uh, here's my old GLD tray. Uh, this is from uh, a little bit before, but this is where I was coming up with those numbers off the top of my head. You can see, I'll switch this over to uh, this number. So you can see that basically I drew that a little bit wild. There's that 50, uh, 10 as kind of taking into account the entire time frame, right? And the current is like 25, 26. Well, I just talked about, we want to kind of take some of that, you know, that froth out of it. Well, if we talked about the current being the high right now, uh, the low being, let's say it's, uh, you know, that's kind of hard. Let's, let's just do this. I'll do, draw a bunch of lines. Uh, that's, let's call that 14. And then say, say the high, maybe we don't think that it's necessarily out of the woods yet for this 50. Um, but we could say that the high, uh, is like, I don't know, what's, what's a, a good kind of take out some of that real crazy pandemic kind of thing. I'd say that that's pretty close to being that high. So what is that? 37 and a half, the low, we're going to call it about 15. So we could take the, uh, the current, which is 25 in this case, 25 minus the low, which we said was, um, let's call it 15 just to make math easy. And the high is 37 and a half or 37, just to stay with it. And, uh, the low is 15, right? So basically we're looking at 10 divided by uh, 22, right? So basically we're looking at this being um, four, uh, 40 something, or uh, so we've got 88, so 12, so 20, 40-ish. All right, 45, somebody threw out there for me, 45, thank you, I was struggling. Uh, 45, so basically 45 percentile, right? So we could say that, you know, either way, it's still pretty decent implied volatility because uh, with this one, what we're gonna be looking at is my rule, another red light, green light thing, right? So we're gonna be looking at the guidelines here, all right? So for um, for a stock on this rule, if we have a stock, we're going to be looking at uh, greater than fifty percent. Uh, we're looking to sell, and for an ETF, if it's greater than thirty, I'm looking to sell. All right, um, and obviously flipping that on its head uh, you know if it's if it's less than 50 percent for a stock i want to buy and for an etf um, i say less than uh, 30 percent we want to buy and why is an etf different you guys it's because it's a basket of goods all right and when you have a basket you can think of you know, all of the different ones, some of them are going up, some of them are going down, they kind of meld each other out. And yes, you could be getting into this and looking to sell premium uh, when it's above 50 and it continues to go higher, right? I mean, obviously it can go to 100 uh, because then that's 100 percentile of where uh, the high is and every tick higher is still 100%, just like the low is still a down tick lower than the previous low is still zero. All right. So yes, there is a little bit of, um, there's a couple problems with this. All right. 
But the fact of the matter is, is, you know, obviously this kind of debunked some of my theory, right? But stocks and ETFs usually have a pretty good range that they, they stay within, all right? They'll rally up, but they'll top out at a certain level and then kind of revert back to the mean. So yes, it can go higher than when we first get into selling this strategy. But the fact of the matter is, is we know it wants to revert back to the mean. So we're just, we're trying to increase our probabilities of success, all right? That's all we're trying to do is turn the table a little bit in our favor, all right? It's not a completely sure thing that when you sell that above 50, it's not gonna go a little bit higher and hurt you. But we do know that when we're selling high volatility, it's at the upper range of where it usually gets and it's going to struggle, all right? It's kind of like when it goes up against a Fibonacci, right? The underlying goes up against a Fibonacci. You see a bounce on it a couple of times. It's got resistance there. The same thing happens with volatility, all right? Uh, it gets up against elevated levels and it's, it, it's bumping up against resistance and it's going to want to revert. So uh, if it fits my rule above that, then you're looking at a, a green light. Obviously, if it's not, then you're looking at a yellow light and you're gonna really need to proceed with caution. Um, you know, why would you do it when it was a yellow light? Maybe it was after earnings or there was nothing going on and you thought you believed volatility was gonna to continue to come out of this underlying. That's where you're looking at it being a yellow light, right? Another thing, if you're newer to trading options, you could stretch this out, make this uh, rule right here, the yellow light, and say my rule for a green light is uh, if I wanna sell when it's greater than 75% or uh, greater than 50%, okay? And you could say, I'm buying the stock when it, uh, it is less than uh, 25%, less than 25% uh, and an ETF is less than 15% or something like that, you know? Um, you, could, you can kind of pick those, just kind of stick with that uh, rule there. It's gonna be really hard to find something above 75% these days just because of what we've just recently seen. So you can play around that. And newer options traders, uh, especially on this type of strategy, maybe lean towards uh, this area over here, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all right, pretty clear so far? Well, we've kind of determined this. We have high volatility, right? GLD, we've kind of figured out uh, is, in the 45 percentile. So that means I'm looking to sell options premium on this. Because uh, like with my rule, I said anything above that 30. All right, well, what's the duration? Well, we've already determined we're looking to sell some premium in this strat or in this underlying GLD because we've got that high volatility. That's really the determining factor, Rafik, as to whether we're buying or selling these premiums. We've got this high volatility, we're selling premium. That's our default, That's we followed the guideline. Now, what's the duration? Anybody got the duration? I'm selling premium, I've already determined that because I've got high volatility. What do I wanna do? I wanna take advantage of that theta decay, right? I wanna take advantage of theta decay. So um, I wanna kind of take that sh the shortest route possible to get there, right? I want to kind of, and I don't have to worry about going sideways. So I kind of want to uh, take a short, the shortest trip to get there because, you know, it's high volatility. Roads are going to be busy or whatever. All right. So we're going to kind of streamline that. We want to sell an option. We want to take advantage of or exploit that theta decay. And this is a good representation of theta decay. These are the at the money. We're not doing at the money options on this. No, I'll get to that here in a second. But what we can see is further out in time, theta is less aggressive, but the closer we get inside this 35 days, which I think we're right there at 29-ish, right? You can see what happens to premiums. They really 
come out quickly. Now you can think about this, when you have high volatility, right? We talked about how that increases those premiums. Well, when you have volatility, what it does to this line is it kind of pushes it up. It's like a balloon, you know, you blow it up and it expands and it pushes out. But what happens when that volatility comes back or reverts back to the mean? It comes back down to that line, all right? So really we see our premiums catch up to the line rather quickly so we can get in and out of these trades faster, all right? Now, I kind of screwed up on my GLD trade and I'll talk about that, which is why I still have it on uh, a little bit later here once we get down to it. So what vehicle do we use? The short put. We've got a bullish assumption, high volatility. I want to take advantage of theta decay, shorter duration. I want to sell a put in order to take advantage of that, uh, that move, all right? I'm not worried about downside right now. I've seen that underlying my GLD uh, test, you know, let's just say I, I don't have that trade on, right? Uh, and like today, came down and tested this Fibonacci, right? We've gotten that move up, we came down, bounced, it retested this Fibonacci and rebounded again. I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm not gonna retest that again, right? So I'm not, at all worried about the downside. If I was worried about this downside down here, um, or you know, it retesting down here, then I might start leaning towards the short put spread, which we did last week, right? But in this case, you know, when I'm coming up with a directional assumption, to my my directional assumption is I believe that that's not part of the realm of possibility at this point, right? Um, and you have to determine on your own when you're coming up with your directional assumption. Take all of these things into account. I've got a bullish assumption in this. Am I worried about that downside here? And if you are, then you're going to lean towards that short put spread. Okay. But in my case, you know, and for this webinar, I'm, I'm thinking there's there's no way it's it's breaking below that. Or if it does break below this, then I'm just out. I'm pulling the ripcord if it breaks below 180. Okay. Those could be the ways that you've set up this trade or your, your, your market assumption. So we're leaning towards this short put. Oh, you don't want to change for me that way? So what spots do we want to hit along the road? Well, we I like to go for this one standard deviation. If we think that this is the put side because it's negative, right? Uh, call side is this way. I like to look at that one standard deviation move. Why is the one standard deviation move important? It's a pretty low probability. If you add up all these probabilities of, you know, we're getting into GLD right here, you know, this is where it currently is, you know, it's trading at unchanged. Uh, you know, when you, if you were to go out and buy GLD, basically you'd be looking at a 50-50 probability of success, right? So like I said, I'm a little bit worried about market coming down a little bit or trending sideways. So uh, the short put, I sell a put out here, then basically I'm getting that one standard deviation move, which is a 16 delta, all right? Why 16 delta lines up with, if you add up all of these percents all the way out the curve, that very closely comes to 16%. And you basically add up all of these all the way out this way, that's 84%. So, um, you know, I've got basically an 84% probability of success if I sell the 16 put or 16 delta put, right? Because all of now, all of this can happen and I, I'm a winner, which means the underlying could go slightly negative and I'm still a winner. So that's why I like to pick that one. It also, uh, with high volatility, you know, as high volatility happens, you can think of um, volatility as like a big bucket. So right now we've got this one uh, and the bucket's halfway filled. Well, what happens when you got a really full bucket? You know, you can think of this as volatility, right? Well, when you got a really full bucket, you, you, your yield curve gets squished down. And when your volatility bucket pretty empty, then your volatility curve goes like this, right? It's not a perfect example, but 
you know, you get my ideas, it squishes in. Basically, volatility tells us that there's a bigger range possibility, uh, so it squishes it up. We're able to get further away from where the underlying is. And if we believe the volatility is gonna revert back to the mean, then, or at least start coming out, well, that volatility, well, the, the curve starts squeezing in like this, all right? And that's what we want, because um, we want those probabilities of us being in the money at expiration to start decreasing. So a uh, couple of things to think about, uh, you know, uh, so I wanna pick that 16 delta put, all right? For selling short put, we wanna look at that 16 delta. So uh, really quickly, let's do a slight review here. So direction, we've got a bullish direction, right? We've got a bull direction because that's the first thing we usually talk about or when we come up with something. We've got, all right, and it's not a spread. I hope I didn't forget to change all those. I did. Um, uh, so we've got a bull direction. Uh, our destination, our destination is the, uh, the, the rule where it is less than or equal to 10 cents, right? or um, we move the decimal or move the dust, the decimal, three ticks, one, two, three, all right? The environment, we want really high ball, right? Greater than, or sorry, uh, let me erase that, I don't want that. Oh, you're not gonna let me erase it there. <laughs> it's because it's over here. We got two different pens going. There we go. Erase that. Why? Oh, did I just change the ink? Sorry, guys. Eraser. I've got it on eraser. There. All right. So we want it greater, greater than fifty percent for a stock and uh, greater than 30% for an ETF, which checks that off, we check that off. Duration, well, we've got high volatility that leans us towards, we want days to expiration to be, you know, as close to 35 days to expiration as we can, all right? We, want, we saw why that's where volatility really starts ramping up. Now, it could be 45 days to expiration, right? If uh, It could be, you know, 45, usually it's between 45 and 25 is usually right around that wheelhouse that you're gonna be looking at. In our strikes, we're looking at the 16 delta that we're gonna be doing. Um, now, again, close your eyes real quick. It's not the spread, the short put. Our max profit, well, actually, short put is going to be the same thing, is that net premium received. That's our max profit on this. Uh, our max loss is going to be on the short put, the option strike price minus the premium minus zero. Why zero? Well, because it can't go any lower than zero, right? The underlying isn't going to be negative. A stockholder can't really owe um, the company. So I uh, can't go negative. So basically it's our option strike price minus the original net premium uh, all the way to zero, right? So let's say if you did the 100 strikes, you got $2, you collected $2 for it. That means you can lose $98 all the way to zero, okay? And similarly, your break even is that short put strike minus that premium received, right? That's our break even. So in our case, did the 100 strike, actually we sold the 100 strike for a collection of $2. Basically my break even is $98, all right? So that's easy enough. Now let's take a look at a, uh, a real life example like we were talking about with the GLD. And I'll talk about, um, oh, you know what? I wanna talk about our exit strategy. So um, I wanna talk about the exit strategy. For a winner, I wanna get out at 50% of max profit. And why? Because it can hit the fan, you guys. Like it hit, hit the fan with me in this GLD trade. Uh, I did it 
um, last Wednesday, and and I I got beat up on it. And you're lost. You guys are going to have to figure this one out on your own, right? Now, if my market assumption was it bounced off that Fibonacci that we just talked about at GLD and rallied, it breaks below that uh, Fibonacci and settles below there, I'm out of that trade. Okay, those are things to consider. And I want you guys, just like I've done in this webinar, is you know, write this stuff down, like have your roadmap uh, set up, you know, because you don't want to make a wrong turn. You don't want to mess this up. So write this stuff down when you're doing it. And in GLD, I'm going to be looking at the, uh, I think it's the 170, 172 puts. All right. I think it's the 16 delta there. Uh, but I want to get out for 50% of my max profit on a loss. You, you write this down. It, it breaks, uh, or settles 180. However you want to, want to say, all right, it breaks or settles below 180. I'm going to be out of this trade. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be out on a loss there. You could also say, you know, it, my premiums double in value. So if I'm selling it for a dollar, if it's trading two, you know, my premiums go up to two dollars, I'm out of this trade, right? Because you know you could do it that way because volatility is all of a sudden starting to spike for some reason. And um one thing to note though, we do have a tendency with gold products for some apparent reason, people love to buy options in gold products when they're rallying. All right. So a lot of times in gold, GLD, we will see the market rally and volatility go up. And if volatility goes up, remember, it's still affecting those premiums in the put side as well. All right. So we could see ourselves not making money, even though we're directionally right if that volatility starts jacking up. Um, if I was directionally right, though, I wouldn't worry about it so much. But, you know, if you, I'm just mentioning that because if your rule is my premiums doubled, I'm out, you could be saying this directionally right. and um, your premiums going up. All right. So that's why I like it. A break below this level is somewhere where I'm looking to pull the ripcord and get out. All right. So let's take a, uh, a peek at a real life example real quick. Like, you know, I, I have showed you my GLD trade. Now, uh, with this GLD trade, I got in on this date, right? We came down, covered that gap. I sold those 170 puts for a buck 30. All right. Look, I got the directional move right. We did see volatility expand on this rally a little bit here. Uh, as you can see, remember I was talking about one percentage point moves. Uh, we can see that this went up by, basically it went up by four percentage points. Well, what's four times 21, right? We can go over here and look at the trade uh, thing, you know, or even 15. It went up by 50 cents, right? or 60 cents on this strike here, if we're looking at that, um, these deltas in here. So four times the 13, you know, it went up by, you know, 50 some odd cents, right? So uh, while I was directionally right and that volatility went up, I did sell it in high volatility, but volatility did creep up and it basically was offsetting the, the gains I was seeing in the directional move. Well, <clears throat> you know, just the story of this trade and how this basically fell apart. Uh, I, I still believe this was basically where Buffett was saying he was buying, uh, uh, when the news came out that he was buying into some gold miners, right? Um, so I wanted to stick with the trade because that volatility was ticking me off. And I was really close to that 50% of max profit. I mean, really close, uh, but I was, squeezing it out for a couple of pennies. Now, right, actually a couple of pennies, like a dime. Um, but this is one thing we used to say, you know, on the floor, you know, uh, bulls and bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. Well, this was me trying to be a pig. You know, I, do you want the penny or the trade? Well, I wanted the penny. Uh, and look what happened. Basically, the next day, yesterday, the market just slid out. Well, guess who's on TD Ameritrade? This guy, what's been happening with TD Ameritrade the last couple of days? All kinds of problems. Well, this guy wasn't able to log in yesterday. Um, so I was having all kinds of issues. Uh, 
so that you know I missed that opportunity. And so now we can see that that trade has you know not at 50% of max profit anymore. It's you know a dime away now. Uh, so those are real reasons why I have these these rules. Basically, it happens all the time, right? Stick to those rules. Now, I've got an excuse, but you guys all know what excuses are like. I mean, everybody's got one and they all stink. Um, so look to get out for 50% of that max profit. Uh, you know, I've been trading for a long time and have a little bit higher risk tolerance. I was squeezing it out. If you're newer to options trading, stick to that rule hard, all right? Even put in a GTC order to just get clipped on it, all right? Because, you know, you're, you'll always look back and say, you know what, I could have done better on that trade. But you never look back after you get out of that trade and see that it just got sho would have shoved down your throat, right? I mean, this trade really went bad, uh, and I should have gotten out of it. Now it's gotten that bit of a rebound, uh, so I'm pretty comfortable with it. And um, we'll look to get out again at 50% of max profit, okay? Having said that, as a matter of fact, the way that the chart set up is I'm actually would consider getting into this, you know, add to some winners. And by doing that, I would look to sell this 172 strike at, you know, a dollar and five cents or something like that uh, and try and take advantage of this move here. So I would be looking to sell the 172 uh, calls in this, which is that 16 delta, all right, to uh, take advantage of it. Uh, how to exit a short put and take profit. So if I were to do this today, you know, say for instance, we were, or tomorrow, uh, when I, we wake up in the morning, I would sell it at uh, 105, trying to get in, if I was gonna do it right now, get in and sell that trade at 105. So I'm gonna try and sell it at 105, uh, put that order in, you know, for whatever tranche quantity you are comfortable with doing. And if I got filled at 105, I would immediately look at that and say, you know, I got into the, I would write all those things down, all right? I would write down the rate of uh, what the de my assumption was, why, you know, maybe why I came up with it, especially if you're a newer trader. So you guys can have the data. I have three ring folders coming out the yin yang from all of the trades that I've done. Like I write all those down. Why? Because I can go back and look at those things, you know, like what was I doing then? Have I, uh, you know, because I, I do change um, and kind of adapt. And sometimes those newer changes don't work out. And I go back and look at the data uh, to see what was working before and, you know, why it's not working now. So that you can have all that stuff to look at. So I would write down, I had a bullish assumption this. If it breaks below 180, I'm out. Um, if, uh, you know, or your the premiums doubled. Why I got into this trade. Uh, what the duration was, you know, writing down the duration and all of those things, where I'm getting out would be at uh, 50 cents, right? Because that's 50% of max profit. My max profit, whenever you're selling premium, my max profit is this collection of premium. So it, right now it's at $1.05, so I'd say, you know, maybe 52 cents. Uh, put in that, you can put in that GTC order, you could switch it to a GTC, you know, to get out. So it will just clip you when it happens, you know, especially if you're not around all the time. You know, I'd sit here at the the desk all day long, but you know, if it if you're not around or you work or something like that, you don't want to miss it. I have no problem with you putting in a GTC uh, to get out at 50 cents. That makes sense. And, you know, for me right now, you know, it tested this. If it breaks below this 180, win, lose, or draw on either one of these trades I'm talking about, the one that's currently up money or the one that I'm considering putting in at the 172 strike, uh, then um, I'd look to get out of it. But, you know, do I think it's going to break below this 172? We've got another round of quantitative easing coming, right? We've got more stimulus checks, which means crank up the printing press, which means devaluation of the dollar, which means dollar denominated products go higher. Uh, theoretically, it doesn't always happen, but theoretically they should start moving higher. All right. So uh, that 172 strike, I, you know, I got the 170 strike, which 
I really liked because it was well below this second Fibonacci. Again, we've got the 172 Fibonacci or that strike, which is going to act as support, right? Um, but I'm collecting a dollar for it. So my break even is at 171 on that trade, right? That's my break even. So, you know, I've got some wiggle room to the downside. I've got basically two support areas. All right. Uh, how do you how how do you sell? Short put is already sell option. I cannot understand how to close the sell put. Um, all right. So this would be the opening of the trade, right? When I sell the put now, Rafik, I don't know where you live, but um, you know, in the U.S. You know, you can sell this. If you're in an IRA, it's going to have to be a cash secured put, which, you know, you that means you're willing to buy it down there. They're going to make you put up some margin. All right. So you might be dealing, uh, Rafik, in the UK. I'm not quite sure how they uh, do this, but, you know, for me, I can go in there. I also have uh, like level four options clearance. You might have to get clearance for options trading. The other thing is um, they might not allow you to sell a naked short put. Um, if you should be able to sell a put uh, easier than you can sell a call naked, uh, but you might have to put up the, the amount of money you would willing to be willing to buy it at that level with margin and stuff like that, okay? Uh, I don't know how that works, but you basically you go in and you sell it you got to put up margin, which means you you have to securitize some losses here, all right? You're going to collect a credit, but you're going to put up a couple of thousand dollars in margin, for instance. So if I confirm it, you can see that uh, max profit is that $1.05. Uh, max loss is $17,000, not including dividend. Well, that's because our uh, our underlying can go to zero, right? And I'm doing a hundred shares. Each under each each option, one not contract, is worth a hundred of the underlying. So if it goes to zero, that's how much I could lose, right? Um, buying power effect. This is how much margin I would have to put up to do this one lot. Now, if it's a cash secured, you're probably going to have to put up like seven thousand dollars, maybe at most, I would think, uh, because you're going to have to cash secure it. Um, so uh, that that could be an issue there. Now, to get out of it, once you own this, as this underlying goes higher or theta eats away, which is five cents every single day, right? I mean, 10 days from now, if this underlying stayed right here, didn't really move, just kind of bounced back and forth in 10 days, we're right back where we were. Volatility didn't change, just that theta component. Well. 10 days, that's 50 cents, right? Every single day I'm losing five cents from it, which is what I want, that theta component, eating away at it, all right? Uh, you know, volatility came out by three or four percentage points, which is not that much. I would be at that 50% of max profit, right? Um, so that's what I'm trying to set myself up for is this theta component eating away, a couple of percentage points in the vega coming out of it, and a directional move to the upside uh, will, you know, all of those things coming together would help me get to 50% of my max profit. I don't want to go and ride this out to the end of the day. All right. I'm not trying to get my entire uh, max profit. I like to swing for singles and doubles. All right. And triples. I don't like to swing for the home runs, which is basically trying to squeeze this. I used to say, squeeze it out for every last penny. No, that's not me. I like to kind of ring it out. <laughs> I like to just get a little bit of it. Somebody else can squeeze it all out. Um, you know, whoever I set, buy it back from can squeeze out those last little drops. Um, I'd rather just move on, right? Move on to another trade. That makes sense, profit. But write those things down. You know, I'm out of fifty percent of max profit. I I knew I collected that dollar and five cents, right? So I'm getting out of fifty cents. That's 50% of this, right? Divided by two. 
All right, cool. All right, so hey, you guys, volatility is pretty high right now. We are in the middle of earnings season. This is our offer for you. I'm gonna throw this over there in the chat window. We've been going back and forth in the questions box. Uh, I just sent this link out here in the chat window. Um, that's a hot link. Uh, if I put it out over there in the questions box to make it easy for you guys, believe it or not, it's actually harder. You have to try and copy and paste it. Somehow it doesn't really hot link it. That chat window will send you right to this page that you can take advantage of for 36 bucks. Uh, this is uh, earnings with options. If you want to learn how to trade options around earnings, I've got some of the best strategies for trading earnings, the you know, highest probability strategies. And I also show you the pitfalls that some of these guys that are online trading uh, on TV um, are telling you guys to implement different option strategies based on the assumption they have on these things. Well, I can tell you, I don't care if you're following their assumption or what their uh, bullish or bearish move they believe is gonna happen for that earnings. What I care is, listen, follow the guidelines I set up for you in these options uh, course here because you, you'll have a better probability of success. You can be directionally right with some of these option strategies these guys on TV are telling you, and you are gonna lose well more than $36 on one trade, all right? So take advantage of this. Literally, if I save you from doing the wrong thing on one uh, earnings trade, it's worth the $36, you guys, because you're gonna be losing hundreds of dollars. So take advantage of it. It's a great course for uh, a great price right now. I mean, listen, if you paid the normal price for this, you'd probably still save money. I mean, one bad option trade uh, for earnings would cost you probably more than a thousand bucks. So it's a bargain basement to be quite honest. So over there, if you guys like how I teach, some of this stuff is resonating with you. I mean, I know there, somebody else can teach you how to trade options, but they aren't going to go into these nuances and give you strike locations and why that strike location is the best. I mean, even on spreads, I'm giving you strike locations, when, where, and why those strike locations are better than what other people are using. So check that out. Uh, like I said, if you're watching this on tape delay, you're gonna have to type it in. It's not on a chat window anywhere. Alexander, I see your question there. I'll try and get it here in a second. Let me just run through all of this real quick. Also in later webinars, drill down on different option components, when and where I find those appropriate. Again, here is that option course uh, link if you're watching it on tape delay. Obviously over there in the chat window is the easiest way to get it if you're watching right now. 310-598-6677 or trading at protraderstrategies.com is the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, also, you have any questions, comments, or webinars you want to see us do, reach out to us, let us know. Love to chat you guys up. All right. So uh earnings, you can still also, oh, one thing I forgot to mention with this earnings course is it's not only just about that earnings for that particular underlying now, as we're coming out of earnings seasons or earnings season, it's the setup for the next earnings cycle right? Especially if you like this stock or don't like this stock and you want to get ready for the next earning cycle, you don't think they're going to do very well, like the banks aren't going to do very well or whatever in the next earning cycle. And you've got that long, uh, long term uh, bearish underlying or bullish underlying. Well, this will set you up for that quite nicely. All right. So that's all you got there. Uh, finally, Please take a moment to go over this disclaimer. We are an educational company. I'm not trying to get you guys to buy into my bullish assumption in GLD. I might be completely off my rocker, right? But what I'm trying to do here is teach you guys how you, you guys come up with your assumption. I don't want to give you guys trade recommendations. Why? Because I can be wrong, right? I, I don't know that you're... Uh, directional assumptions any better or worse than mine. So that's what makes this all a great market is you can have your assumption, I can have my assumption, but one thing we do have to probably agree on, and I think that I made a case for that, is how we figure out which option strategy is the best one for a particular assumption, all right? 
And with this one, we can be a little bit wrong and still make money. And that's what I'm trying to do is increase my probabilities of success because I don't always pick the right time to get in. I'm usually actually early on every move, all right? Um, so, you know, I, I usually take heat before everybody else. Uh, so, uh, you know, make sure you take a moment to go over this to know your risks because uh, they, they can be substantial, all right? So let me get back to Alexandra. What were you saying? Please do not say that type or say yes or no. You think it will go lower because there is a gap uh, way up. It's been 171, 172, which needs to be filled. Uh, I see another small gap between 73 and 72. Thank you on the webinar. Uh, thank you, I appreciate the kind words. Well, yes, I understand what you're saying there. Uh, but basically, Alexander's talking about here is these little gaps down here. So there are some gaps there. And yes, they do need to be filled. Do I think they're going to get filled right away? I I don't. I, not in this kind of environment. Uh, if, um, you know, right now it's a race to debase, right? We know the current administration does not like a strong dollar. We're already seeing China start uh, doing their own quantitative easing. Uh, some other countries are doing it. Well, what's kind of like on the docket really soon is whether or not we have our next round of stimulus. Um, and if there is that next round of stimulus, that means they got to print the printing presses and that should give a little bit of a lift here to gold. Now, um, the reason why I picked gold instead of uh, GDXJ or GDL, GLD is the volatility is a little bit low in these. Uh, you can see 21, you know, yes, I could probably discount that and it seems a little bit higher, but it's still pretty low for GLD or GDXJ. So um, uh, GDX, I mean which is the the bigger gold miners, you know, it's still pretty low. So if I had a bullish assumption, you know, in this one, or if I wanted to go straight to the gold miners, then, you know, you're going to be looking at a different option strategy for that bullish assumption, right? Um, so, you know, I kind of wanted to get something that fit my guidelines. <laughs> so that's why I went with GLD again. You know, you could do it with silver as well. Silver's got a 51, um, you know, and selling the uh, 16 Delta for 34 cents. Now, you know, you're only gonna get in and out for 15 cents on this one, right? Because 50% of max profit on this one would be about 17 cents or something, um, which is fine. Uh, you're also not gonna have as much risk to the downside. So silver could be another one. Maybe I should consider silver uh, instead of loading up on GLD because silver, I know at 25, you know, gold is already above our 2008, 2009 highs, um, which was 1923. And that's that level that held support um, as it was resistance before. Now, if we go back and look at uh, silver on a monthly chart, we can see 48 was the high back there. Now, so precious metals, what has more room to the upside, maybe silver does, it has more potential. So maybe I should consider that. I know, a great story about this 48.35. I know somebody who bought $48 even in silver futures. And I doubt he still has them. But on the flip side of that, this is the day that my father-in-law, he is a big coin trader. And this was the day that he, I was talking to him. And when it traded 48 and he, he walked into the pawn shop and sold half of his silver that day. So he, he literally sold it to my friend that was a trader in the pit, who is probably one of the biggest floor traders on the Chicago Board of Trade. Uh, but yeah, I always make a joke. Yep, tell my wife, yeah, your dad literally sold his silver to London. I shouldn't say his name. Uh, the guy on the floor. So um, this is kind of funny. My funny story about silver there. 
At least I think it's funny. All right. So a uh, couple of couple of great. Thank you very much for all the kind words there, you guys. Uh, much precious uh, about it. Much precious about it. That's right. <laughs> all right, guys. That's all I got for you guys. One last thing. If you can't take that, take it easy. Appreciate it, John. Thank you for the kind words. Appreciate it. Let me know. Give me your feedback on it, too. Once you see the course, let me know.